My name is Daniel McLean. I'm a lawyer. I'm also a curator, and I'm involved in um, art law. And um, with me, I have Paula Cooper and Seth Siegelov. Um We're going to discuss issues r rising in relation to collecting, owning uh, contemporary artworks. Um, really, my uh, I'm here to moderate, and uh, speakers are such legends that they don't really need any introduction, and, and I could spend half an hour um, introducing them, which is roughly the time we have here today. So I'm going to avoid the normal um, cursory um, you know, summaries of what they do and what they've achieved, and try and get on with this relatively quickly. Um, I mean, we're looking at this, I think, from two perspectives. Um, the first perspective is just a sort of overview of some of the issues involved in owning and collecting art, and issues connected also to authenticity and systems that artists have devised, such as the artist, con and Steph has been involved with, and Paula, such as the artist contract, which is a way of dealing with ownership problems. Um, and um, the second part, if we have time, will be to do more generally with the question of artist rights, for example, moral rights, the droit de suite, and how these um, rights interact with the rights of collectors, and in a sense, what makes artworks peculiar what differentiates artworks from commodities? Why is owning an artwork different from owning a car or a home? And what, what, why, why the artist doesn't disappear when property, the artwork, has been sold to a collector or a museum, etc.? So um, I'd like to open this by just asking Seth and to talk briefly about what he thinks the main, some of the main issues are and what issues were of concern to him in the 1960s. And we'll take it from there. Uh, originally, when uh, my involvement with art law uh, occurred, which was almost 40 years ago, uh, we were talking about a situation in which the art world was relatively small, relatively poor, uh, with relatively few players. Uh, there was a certain kind of art which was evolving, which was going to a more non-material nature, uh, more ephemeral nature, a more action-oriented nature, which didn't necessarily leave a physical residue like a painting or a sculpture. The moment when we started to draft a, uh, a, uh, a contract, what we were concerned about was increasing the artist's rights vis-a-vis -vis his or her work, and in exchange for that, to provide the collector with a history and a provenance to the artwork they were buying uh, uh, in the form of a continual relationship uh, um, contractual law relationship. I think, Seth, you're talking about the artist reserve right? Yes. The transfer yeah. and sale agreement. This was a seminal agreement that Seth drafted with Bob Chansky in 1971. Our logic here was first and foremost to uh, itemize what the rights of the artist is, uh, the right to uh, well, to show the work, the right to repair the work, the right to control to a certain degree where it is shown, even though he or she may have sold it already to a third, a second party. When I said at the outset that the world was very much smaller, meant means to a very large extent, the first person who buys the work of art was usually someone very close or very much known to an artist. The multiplication of the size of the art world, the amount of artists, the amount of collectors, the amount of museums, has changed this relationship dramatically because very more and more there are people who are buying and reselling and reselling and reselling works. Uh, so I had thought that it would be important to provide some kind of history for a work of art in exchange for guaranteeing the artist uh, certain rights in his work. One of the rights, and the most controversial, of course, was a 
participation in the profits of the work. Uh, and that's Fifteen. Seems, Fifteen. Yeah, that's what the contract called for. But the contract was not written in stone, so to speak, and it was offered to be cut and sliced and diced, uh, to use a current expression, to, uh, to fit the individual concerns of the artist or the type of art. That was the underlying reason for thinking about or doing such a contract, was to what's called today level the playing field. Paula, um, can you can can we Paula, speak a bit about your experience of the uh, artist contract? Yes, uh, I'll I'll just talk about the sure. artists uh, with whom uh, I worked who who used the contract. Uh, the contract was not very popular with that many artists. Uh, some felt it was cumbersome. Some were not interested in different aspects of it. Some were convinced by others that this would inhibit uh, the sale of their works, which was true, it turned out. But uh, the Jackie first Windsor. person I worked with was uh, Jackie Windsor, who started using the contract in 1972 or 73. Her concerns were uh, her main concern was that people would not respect and take care of her work because it costs so little. Uh, and uh, so at the, each contract, I must say, um, mostly institutions uh, acquired her work at that time. Most collectors were against, they were absolutely scandalized that they would buy something, own it, and yet the artist would maintain an interest in it. So um, most institutions uh, have a, a rule that they do not sell the work of living artists. That's most institutions. Some so do So it wasn't such an not. issue for living institutions? But museums. even so, uh, it was an issue because, and we can show this piece, uh, of Jackie. What do I do? I think it's just this not is that. The this is the one we this want the to one? show. The first one. Yes. That one. Oh, yes. Yeah, this piece was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art uh, for very little money, but it was a, a very important acquisition for, for uh, the artist to, to be in the collection. And I must tell you that the correspondence is this thick even though the modern uh, had a policy of never selling the work of a living artist, there were other uh, points in the contract. In the negotiation. In the negotiation. And one of them was that if we do this with Jackie Windsor, we will then be obliged to do it with all artists or any artist who wishes to do so. So these contracts, uh, each one was different and required a lot of negotiation and there were changes in them. But was the main substance of the contract respected? Remi yes, it was. And so the modern has this piece. Then um, there were a few private collectors who acquired Jackie's work and one of them, uh, this piece was owned by a private collector who, although he did not like the idea of the contract, he loved the piece so much that he acquired it. Uh, he died, and his estate sold the piece. And ironically, it was bought by the Museum of Modern Art. Was it sold using the con Was it sold? And it was sold because the contract uh, was in, in place. In place. And she received and a fifteen percent benefit on the she received fifteen percent of the increase in value, the yeah. difference between the purchase, purchase price, price and, and the sale and price. price. And she made more money on that little fifteen percent than she had on the original sale. Now Jackie stopped using the contract when um, the cost of her work reached a figure, which was two figures, two, um, 
So she felt that people would take care of the work, respect it, and she stopped using so the, the, the con contract. So the, the contract then would be for unsuccessful artists. As no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and then I do work with an artist now who, who continues to use the contract. And as Seth knows, was one of the first mm -hmm. artists to use, maybe the first, Hans Hacke. Hans, yeah. And uh, I think he's the only artist I Who know. Who has consistently used the... Yes. And now... Do you think the contract has anomaly. relevance? I mean, it doesn't have relevance, you think? And do you think it's a utopian it 1960s? Does for him. It still has for him, but he's a very specific artist. How much wider relevance do you think the contract would have for today's artist in today's art market? How much wider? Relevance. I mean, do you think artists could... Why do you think artists should use it, or do you think they could use it? I think that with Hans, it's a matter of principle. He wants to be able to borrow the work at certain times. Uh, at this point, he wants to protect his family. Should he die, then he even yes, added a clause saying that, and this was tough to get by uh, any, uh, and mostly institutions acquire his work. But that's a tough one to, to negotiate. And each contract with, with is, is a very long process and complicated, yeah. Because once you introduce lawyers, as you know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it gets very complicated and every single point is um, looked at. And Seth, what was your experience of the, of the reception of the contract? Well, let me say this. Uh, f first, uh, I am not necessarily here, or we're not necessarily here, just discuss the contract. Right. Uh, this is something that I did 40 years ago with uh, lawyer Bob Pachansky, and I've been busy doing other things in the last 40 years, so I'm not sitting here saying everyone should use the contract, it's fantastic. Uh, what it was was an attempt to delineate the rights and responsibilities between the artist and the collector. And we had felt that in exchange for a, uh, an obligation, a written obligation between the artist and the first seller who would be obligated to pass it on as part of the work of art, you would be building up a provenance mm -hmm. to, for the work of art and its traceability. And this problem... This, so this benefits collectors as well as it artists? It benefits especially collectors uh, in the sense that you have a history of work. Most artists, and most artists that I know, uh, and I dare say even successful artists, have no idea where the work is when they were young. No one takes care of it. Most, very often, uh, it's destroyed, uh, which is another problem, of course. But there was an attempt to build up from the very earliest moments the possibility of keeping a track on the works of art. That the, and, the, and if a work of art was dealt with in this particular way, then the collector in exchange for being party to this transfer process is also protected. Is also protected because that's part of the deal. That's the deal. Now, there's many other ways probably to do this. This is the way that I came up with, we came up with in 1970 to be able to deal with this question. But what we wanted to do, we did it this way because it was essentially a private transaction. And as anybody who's been in the art world knows, there's a lot of funny money floating around there. And people don't <laughs> necessarily want to get pinned down to sort of a central registry. Many of the other industries, uh, cultural industries, if you want to call them that today, like music industries, have centralized agencies which collect you know, money for the Beatles or, or publishers. I mean, I'm also a publisher and I receive yearly rights to the books, uh, you know, for reproduction rights, who knows what else, uh, the things like this. So at that time, because of the nature of the art world at the time, I felt it would be best to have some private relationship, just a little, little cruddy piece of paper attached to an artwork. I mean, in practice, that hasn't worked out, but art other artists have developed other systems. Sure I wondered whether you could just speak briefly about Carl Andre's yes. system, because I think that's very interesting in this uh, context. Some artists uh, use um, certificates, and particularly in the case of Carl Andre, where his work could be copied very easily. Yeah. Uh, it is the certificate yes. that is the proof of, of the piece. Yes. 
and, and, and he has, a, from my understanding, he has a very quite a efficient system of registering titles so that yes. every time there's a transfer, of, a work is transferred, that work must be registered with, with, with Andre. Right. That's, that's right. Yes. And how widespread is this idea of, in your... Pro well, uh, Solowit used uh, certificates. And there was a registration if, system. If, uh, if works weren't signed, some works were signed. Uh, then there had to be a certificate. And this is particularly true of the wall drawings. Yes, yes. Every wall drawing must have a certificate. certificate. So there are different ways of dealing with this, and there are different reasons. But, and now as these artists who have used or who have been involved with thinking of uh, protecting themselves and protecting owners, uh, as they are. What about younger artists from your experience? Have younger artists in your gallery, for example, followed either of these systems? Because they seem to be systems that have borne out a very particular moment within contemporary art. Not yet. Not yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> but probably at a certain point, point. It, it might be necessary Sorry. or they would consider that. It is a way of, of uh, keeping track of of works and their, where they are. I think also, one of the I think one of the advantages also is that there, there isn't this indeterminacy about what is the work. If it's very clearly defined at the outset through the certificate, there's a clear relation between work and and ownership, and that nexus is very important. I mean, one problem I think is I mean, it, it, it's come across. I've come across this problem recently it, um, in relation to an artist's estate who are very unhappy about the way in which a museum. Uh, quite a pr prominent museum is reclassifying work in the collection, which was documentation originally as work. So mm -hmm. the museum is in the process of reassigning a aesthetic, cultural, and economic value to the material in its collection when it wasn't originally designated as as, an art, as artworks. And I think that's interesting wow. um, with the certificate because if you have the certificate, there's no question. There's no question. So yeah. maybe what this also points to is that where the uh, kind of difficulties, conceptual difficulties or ambiguities or open, the work, artwork is open, there is a need for a kind of system of administration to help identify the work but also to administrate title. And I think maybe that's why this was so important for the 1960s artists. You, you take someone like Lawrence Wiener. He I does mean, the how same. Could you, he would have to, yeah. really. Because well, anyone could. In the case of Lawrence, uh, for many years, he's had a lawyer register the works or the exchange of the work. It's kind of like a private county clerk's office, I suppose, or a cadastro or something, uh, to, uh, to uh, have a, a record, not quite public. It's not like you can walk into City Hall, uh, the county clerk's office, and find out who owns this, who owns that. Uh, and specifically, this problem is because uh, the art world is a very private bit of business here. Eh? And uh, it's... Um, you know, it's a totally unregulated, call it an industry now. Uh, uh, a lot of questions concerning rights and interests are becoming, uh, coming up to the fore. And not just simple questions like, you know, forgeries, or is this really a war hall or not a war hall, or things like this. But the nature of art has become much more idea-oriented, performance-oriented, reproduction of photographs oriented. So there's, I would say, like, oh, pick a number, pick a number. But uh, let's say 50% of the work being done by young artists can be, you know, be included in that photographs, performances, uh, uh, videos, uh, uh, abstract uh, uh, happenings, or call it what you will. Uh, and so it's taken another dimension because it's no longer when I was writing this, or we were thinking about it, you know, we probably had in the back of our head, more or less, you know, putting a, a, a piece of paper on the back of a de Kooning drawing or something like yes. that. And because, but uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a means to uh, ensure the artist's awareness of also the awareness of the work, awareness of the work where it is, yes. I mean, aware of where the work has been going to and who owns it and things is a mean of tracking it. And uh, Carl's system is, uh, which, while a private system, uh, I mean, 
It's I, don't, I don't think you can, I'm almost sure you can't go into Carl's files and determine who owns what, uh, the way you do when like people die. Well, it, it, is, it is preparing for the catalog, catalog resume, resume, so it's yeah, not that so secret. Yeah, well, he but has will the to owner, do sorry, sorry, so will the owners be disclosed when there's the catalog resume? Will they? If, yeah. if the owner a consents, he consents right. to that, otherwise it's private collection yeah. uh, yes. Oslo. Or yeah. Well, Carlos yeah. has done at least two catalog raisonnés up until now. He's well, they reading. build. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't more, go more. beyond your yeah, age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, um, whether it will be printed or not, it's still basically a private system, and it's people may or may not, as you just said, uh, uh, would want to know it. But the issues have become very much more complicated, the legal issues. For example, so just in the reproduction of work. Can you just finish, Seth, because I'd like to open sure. it. Sure. Yeah. When? No. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that abrupt. Okay. I'd like to thank you very much. Um, I think th this discussion has been very interesting, and in particular, the role of this, the, uh, the certificate, the, the system of registration, and also Seth's pioneering uh, artist contract. Uh, I would like to open this out to the audience now, and um, I wonder whether anyone has any questions. Hi, Daniel. Hi. I'm <laughs> I hope it's addressed to yeah. Seth or Paul or the question. Okay. Go. It's, it's addressed to yeah. you, though. Good. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, I'm really interested in art law, and I was wondering how you got on t into the industry and if there are many other lawyers, you know, practicing in that niche. Um, there are quite a few, um, and I'm working on with Seth on kind of providing an information service for the art world, which will explain um, and provide people with information about this. Um, that's going to come out so sometime in the next in a fall. In a fall, yeah. Um, I, you will be, I, I can provide you with details that, about that later on, but I'd like to, to can we move on? Hi. But I, Sorry, I, I, can we, I think we should try hey. and talk about the issues. In the what, what are you doing if the estate gets creative? Sorry? If what? what are you doing if the estate's getting creative? Oh, the if the date is if, when, when the changed. estate no when the, oh, estate the estate of an artist yes, the, estate's the estate getting creative how is the oh, law yeah. then yeah. well okay. you then then the the estate is taking the place of the artist uh, but can can in terms of copyright if if the estate has been given that yeah, but right when when the artist dies, I mean, the someone has to be responsible, or someone has to be named. Or, or a more concrete case, for example, in Venice, there was a Palermo piece reproduced. Uh, who can stop a curator of doing that? I mean, uh, are you are you sorry? You're talking about how are you talking legal legal implications around artworks. About yeah, I mean, like well, there's copyright. I mean, there will be copyright in the original artwork. So the the person who owns the copyright who will be the artist normally, and then normally the artist's estate afterwards can take action to prevent the unauthorized reproduction of the artwork. That's a kind of basic copyright right. But in that case, it didn't protect the work. It, it, I think it, Are you it, saying the estate did this or, the, or somebody I, else? I don't know who did it. I just was wondering what is the legal condition for such an action, for example? The legal condition for an action is, a, is, is in copyright. And there are also potentially moral rights issues as well about breach of the integrity right, for example, or the attribution right. But, okay. but I think there's another interesting question about the authorization of works um, posthumously when the artist dies. And we didn't really have a ta chance to t discuss this today, but the, the, how, the lack of transparency of criteria of, of very well-known estates and what they, how they authenticate and who decides and on what basis. And often the, um, the relationship between dealers and artist estates, which also an, are um, problematic to say the least. And I think this is an area, it's very complex, which requires Re, re, real regulation in the future because I think when an artist is alive there's n there isn't this question of intentionality but when 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 an artist dies this whole problem of intentionality arises and you and particularly if the artists themselves are making very difficult work work where the boundaries between a work or a non-work or a document are not clear um, and I and I, obviously the, there's been this recent controversy with the Warhol uh, Foundation so I think um, 
one of the tasks of perhaps clarifying these conditions during the lifetime of the artist is to prevent their proliferation after death. And that's one of the virtues of the Carl Andre system, for example. Also, I should mention while you're giving the thing, uh, the, the microphone, is that clearly all this is generated by the value, the increased value of artworks. These problems really don't quite exist uh, when you have a smaller community and less money involved. But when someone's talking about protecting a purchase they made for $2 million, uh, all sorts of people, including lawyers, including <laughs> lawyers uh, will put their, you know, have enough room to get in there to be able to adjudicate it and things like this. Uh, and, uh, but this is because the art world has changed dramatically in that sense too. And uh, well, certainly myself, you know, we're brought up in another environment entirely. And it's, so it's worth making a point that when Seth created the artist contract, moral rights um, were very weak. Well, they were non-existent in the United States and you didn't have the Dwada Suite. And so the Dwada Suite is the, the resale royalty right, which is now recognized across the EU, for example, um, and is also... And not, France. Uh, and yes, has France has always had a strong regime. And so it's interesting because the civil law countries and the common law countries are sort of converging. And in a way, legislation, statute, is actually giving increased recognition and protection of artists' rights. So in that respect, I think there's a kind of prophetic aspect of what you were doing in the, in, in, in the 70s. And there's also recognition within law and culture at large that artists are still connected with their artworks and must be connected with their artworks after the artworks have been transferred and sold to collections. But also there's new rights that have come up. <laughs> Can I, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. you better yeah, yeah. ask a question. Sorry, uh, sorry. Well, <laughs> I was going to say one of the, the very useful things about the contract after you sort of you know, convince, get, convince whoever you need to convince to yeah. kind of sign on to it is that it's a template. It's a standardization of, of terms. So while it can be sliced and diced, as you said, yeah. once, once you become familiar with it, you recognize that if it's used elsewhere. So what I was wondering is if any of you know whether there is some kind of standardized template or contract that's being developed to, um, sort of protect people's rights in, in media work, both sort of collectors and, and uh, artists, because it seems like video and digital work yeah. um, have shared issues that could be addressed yeah. in there some are, kind of There contract. are shared issues. Um, to my knowledge, no. Yes. Yeah. Are they standardized? But, but it, it also yeah. works two ways now, because artists are using <laughs> material that's in, in out in the world and uh, yeah. so you've got a double-edged double question there. Absolutely. What do you... Well, I was going to comment that uh, uh, the law concerning photographs of work has changed dramatically uh, as far as I understand. Uh, if I make a photograph of a work of John Jones, he copyrights it or she copyrights it. It's not the photographer who's the right to do this. And I uh, uh, well, that's another that that's interest. another complex issue actually about com <coughs> commissioned artworks also create problems of authorship, and who controls the copyright. But all these problems were barely existent. Well, in the like in the sixties, in the sixties or seventies or before, the problems just didn't uh, exist. All you were talking about really was fraud. Fraud. I mean, people painting Van Gogh's paintings or something, or or can we have one? Can we have one last? Sorry to interrupt again. Okay. Can we have one last question? <coughs> this is a question for, for you, Mr. McLean. You as an independent uh, curator, yes. um, which are, uh, according with your criteria, which is the, the best conditions or the ideal conditions for a museum, for the preservations of the work arts? For example, the Louvre. With the, any museum. Well, it, I think it would be great if a museum could be run by an artist. <laughs> but I can't see that happening. I know Tino Segal wants to do that, but I think it's a long project. <laughs> it's a very big question. I mean, very big question. Should we discuss it afterwards? I don't know. I mean, it's such a deep, long question. Um, it's quite complex. I mean, I think artists... 
I think artists increasingly, and I'm sure Paula could speak a lot about this, have become frustrated with institutions, whether they're private or public, and how their works are controlled. And that idea for self-determination became very much part of people like Donald Judd's project in Marfa, so that they could control their condi the conditions of the exhibition of their own work. And I think, but I think it's very difficult for artists to do that until they achieve a, a certain position in the art market uh, and an economic and social position in the art market. So otherwise, artists really have to rely on other mechanisms when their art is transferred. And that's why I think the law becomes very important as a kind of mechanism for protecting artists um, after, prop, after the artwork has been transferred. Um, how effective it is is a question. And also, there is the issue. I mean, for example, you have the Richard Serra trial where there's a catastrophic failure um, of, a, of, a, of a government to protect a, a leading a, a tilted arc, a work which was site specific. So, that kind of situation like tilted arc, I think the law now potentially would prevent and should be there to prevent the removal of works like Tilted Arc. Um, but then, of course, you have the question of how far, um, whether the balance between owners, collectors, and artists is drawn in the right way. And so you have another type of dispute, like the Christoph Buschel trial in 2007, where it was a commissioning art. The trial arose in a, it's a quite complex, but it arose out of a commissioning process which went wrong. And then there's the question of whether Mass Mocha could exhibit a work which had been disclaimed by the artist during the public process, during the commissioning process, and in the end, the, the court said they could. So, it, in a sense, the court there, the U.S. court, actually gave a very weak recognition of artists' rights. My feeling is that there should be stronger protection of artists' moral rights, but through statute rather than through con because I think contracts are very weak mechanisms for protecting artists generally because ultimately it's about the bargaining positions between the collector, the artist, and the gallery. Is that? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to be here today with such esteem. Thank you, Thank you so much, Paula. Nice to meet you.